Christmas. Welcome to Camelback Bible Church. We're so glad that you guys joined us this morning, uh, typically our lightest service of the year. Uh, so glad that you're here with us to worship this morning. A couple of th- reminders just as we begin. First, uh, Teleos classes are scheduled to start uh, around the 10th of January, and so if you haven't already, I encourage you to download the Church Center app and just check out what uh, adult classes are coming up, what options there are, and uh, register if you haven't already to, to participate in those. And the second is that next Sunday, uh, we'll begin doing our first Sunday collections again. Uh, in the past, we've collected for a food bank and then also for uh, Hope Women's Center, and so we do have those kicking back off next Sunday. There should be lists on the tables in the back, uh, just the food items that we're, we're, use, uh, we're collecting, and then also toiletry items for Hope Women's Center. Um, we are partnering with Creighton Community Foundation now for our food bank. Uh, in the past, we've worked with Camelback High School, but they're not operating their food pantry right now, and so we're partnering with Jeff Bowles and his ministry, and we're excited to do that. So I encourage you to participate in that, and if you're able, either drop it off on Sunday morning, or you can bring it by the office during the week. Uh, we'd love to have you join us in that each month on the first Sunday. Um, as we think about this Sunday, as we remember what we've celebrated this past week, the coming of Christ and uh, in the form of an infant, uh, entering into this world, uh, God in flesh. Uh, we praise him for his gift that he's given to us, his willingness to humble himself uh, and for us to gather together and, and uh, bring him glory and, and worship this morning through that uh, because of what he's given to us. And so uh, let's keep that in mind as we stand together and worship.
by your word, Lord. Recognizing as their hearts have been transformed by your spirit that you are worthy to be worshipped. And in recognition of your righteousness, God, we are convicted of our own sinfulness. We recognize that without you, God, we are hopelessly lost. And yet in that, you gave us the gift of your son coming down to this earth to give us renewed life renewing our hearts and making us new by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father. We praise you for that. That through the death and resurrection of Christ, we might have hope for eternal life. May we believe and encourage one another to believe in this today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
glasses if they're headed there. Let's go ahead and have a seat. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to gather together and worship, uh, whether it be in person or online. And God, we thank you for uh, the gift that you've given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray for uh, this community at Camelback, Lord. We ask that you would continue to be with us, giving us guidance and wisdom as we head uh, into the new year. And Father, remind us this day that the mission of Christ did not end with his ascension, but was given to us that we have been called to go forth and to make disciples, proclaiming the truth of the gospel, Lord, living it out, uh, being generous with all that you've given us, Father, being uh, abundantly kind and uh, being overwhelmingly loving to this world, Father, in this city and around the globe. God, we pray that you would continue to, to draw us closer together to one another, Father, building a community that supports one another. And we praise you for those who are able to help, uh, whether it be in their community groups, for the opportunity we've had to, to share in benevolence needs, providing for the physical needs, for those seeking to bring comfort and love to those who have been isolated throughout this year, Father. And God, we continue to pray for them that they might find community uh, in, in any form that we can provide, Lord. God, we ask that you would continue to, to be with us, instilling in us a sense of mission as we go forth, Lord, being encouraged by those who we support around the world. We pray especially for the missionaries that we have as part of our family who are in Europe, uh, dealing with more lockdowns and barriers to their ministry, Father, and uh, we think especially of the Benegas family mourning the loss of, of Jonathan's mother this year and the first Christmas without her. God, we ask for comfort and peace to them. We ask for strength and boldness to all of our missionaries around the world, Lord, that they may continue to bring hope through the gospel to those in need in so many ways, Father. God, we pray that they would be an encouragement to us that as we think about how we might continue to pursue you this year, Father, and even in new ways that we might be emboldened to go and share your gospel uh, as, with one another, with our neighbors, our coworkers, our family, and our friends, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You give life. Your friend. 
sing that first verse one more time. You give life. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. David said he was so glad that he could worship corporately. And you know what? I feel the same thing. It's been a long time. We're going to look at the uh, book of Ezekiel chapter 36 this morning. And I know it's in the middle of a book and it's probably out in the middle of nowhere. But we just finished on this Advent series, the fact that Christ has come. 600 years prior, we have a prophet that was instructing Israel under a really difficult time of judgment, war, captivity. And all of what he was saying wasn't only pertinent to the time and context, it was also future tense to what we know, now call the church of Jesus Christ. So in, in a bunch of waves of captivity, they would uh, sack some of the land. They took uh, Daniel captive in 605. Ezekiel was, was captive in 597. And then finally, the whole thing imploded. And we know that sometimes we look back at when they were so desperate Um, to flee and so forth. And yet God over all of the uh, Old Testament figures kept preserving his people. So we want to understand that God's provision to his church today is the same. He cares about his church. Despite everything that's going on around it, such as all this nonsense, (laughs) that we have to cope with. But we want to see in God's word this morning, how is it that God protects his people? So let's bow in prayer before we start our text, okay? Thank you, Father, for your beauty of your holiness. You are our strong tower, our rock, a refuge in a time of trouble. And we ask that you would grant us fresh wind and fresh fire by your power. Your word is alive, a two-edged sword able to cut through the deception of the world, the lies of the devil, and to renew our minds through Christ Jesus. Without you, we can do nothing. With you, nothing is impossible. So by your sovereign grace, may your word fill each hungry soul gathered here in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to begin reading in Ezekiel chapter 36 with verse 22. It starts like this, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes, and I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. Let's pause here for a second. Here we have a promise 
of a covenant God. And yes, we're in the context of, of Israel being disseminated and different portions of it being uh, sacked and separated and, and different people are taken in different regions of what would be Babylon, modern day Iraq. And so uh, God through his prophet visits with a message. And in that message, it has a long expanded meaning because we know now from Genesis to Revelation that there's a redemptive history and we are called God's people. And there is a heavenly Jerusalem and there is a Zion. And there's all these distinctions that we see that were placed on Israel, which is now what we would call the modern day church. And so these promises keep unfolding. And the writer to the Hebrews, that whole theme of the supremacy of Christ, better than the angels, better than the prophets, better than the law, took place over time. As a matter of fact, Paul, a uh, well-known apostle in the New Testament, he writes in Galatians 4 and says this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, Abba, Father. And of course, that was written in probably eh, 60 or 70 AD. So we see the fullness of time culminating and God's promises, even though there's been recordings of, of God's people saying, when? When is all this going to happen? When is your promise going to be fulfilled that you will redeem your people? And so that's what this particular chapter happens is that Ezekiel is given this profound insight by the living spirit of God. And so he goes on to say in verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you. Wow. What does that imply? Well, in Exodus 29:20, there's a vivid picture of the ram's blood that was sprinkled all over the pulpit, all over the altar. And when the priest did this, the action actually symbolized an unbreakable bond between God and men, mankind. And it's a very integral part about the ceremony of purification. It confirmed sanctification to the congregation. And so he tells through Ezekiel, I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from your uncleannesses. Notice it's plural. It's not, I'm going to forgive you for a sin. It's for your sinfulness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. God is speaking in first person. This, this is somewhat hard to comprehend. He's using a prophet, and yet God is giving him the words of God first person. I, Jehovah God, am speaking through my prophet. I'm going to do a work in your heart. Why? You need that work. From Genesis 6 on, it says men's hearts were evil continually. We're not going to come to our own reform. We're never going to see that a creator God in all of his blessing of life itself has a whole different dimension of goodness. And so when he says, I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you, it's a picture of cleansing. And yet, what does baptism signify? It signifies us coming up anew. Uh, clean creatures, but the cleansing agent wasn't the water. It was the blood, just like on the pulpit from the ram's blood in the Old Testament. The blood is the cleansing agent, and in our case, it's the blood of Christ shed on the cross for our sins. 
And we bury that in a watery grave and come up a new creature. You know, John's baptism was one of repentance. Why? Unto God. Repentance unto God. Preparing the way. So he goes on to say in verse 25, um, or, uh, 26 rather, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit I'm going to put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone and from, or, or from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That sounds somewhat contradictory. You've got this cold heart, unspiritual, natural heart that doesn't have any gravity towards God. And he says, I'm going to replace it. I'm going to put something within your life that is going to change every spiritual understanding that you ever imagined. And it's going to be his work. It's not going to be your reform. It's going to be his work. Notice what he continues to say. I will put, capital S, my spirit within you and cause, that work is causal, and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. How, do, how does this happen? Does he put us under and put us on some kind of a gurney and start cutting away and then whoosh, get a surgeon in there? And of course, nowadays, that's no big deal to us. We can understand the medical field of a heart transplant. The Holy Spirit is a specialist when it comes to heart transplant. I'll tell you. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go to the next chapter, chapter 37 of Ezekiel, and see what is promised, see what is illustrated, and see how this ex expands a dimension of understanding of this holy phenomena that we would call in modern day language, regeneration. He starts in chapter 37, the hand of the Lord was upon, upon me. He brought me out in the Spirit, same Spirit of God, the Lord set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. And He led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. That means dead past tense. And as He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. Uh, common sense, do you think those skeletons are going to make it? I don't think so. <laughs> Any common brain would say, this is a lost cause. There's no way that femur over there and that rib there and that skull laying there is going to come together and become a new life. Impossible. So, verse 7, or I'm sorry, verse 4, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So he starts preaching. He starts proclaiming. Verse 7, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling everything started connecting. Can you imagine Spielberg with this text in Hollywood? Oh, the cinema stuff they can do now. I'd love to see this. I can see it in my mind now, but oh, on the big screen with surround sound, this would be a fantastic testimony. So he's preaching and they're all coming together, bone to this bone, and hence the Negro spiritual, the hip bone connected to the thigh bone. The de you know, remember we used to sing that song back in the 60s anyway. Maybe you guys forgot it, I don't know. Anyway, all these bones are coming together. Then verse 8, I looked and behold there were sinews connecting them, muscle tissues, and flesh had come upon them and skin then covered it. 
Do you know the human body has five vital organs, 206 bones, 650 muscles, 78 organs, and plus or minus 35 trillion cells that function within our body? And of course, Dr. Milligan, he knows all this already. But I want you to just pause for a moment and think about what our Creator God spoke into place. And that's why you're sitting here right now with audible senses, visual senses, apparatus that can function and breathe and make oxygen come to your lungs. All of that by His design. But we had a problem here. The last part of verse 8. It said, there was no breath in them. Then He said to me, prophesy to the breath. What does that mean? To the air? No, this is a Hebrew word, ruach. Its meaning is vast, but it always depicts the very special divine creative act of immaterial consciousness and inner being. In other words, it's more than just air or oxygen. In Genesis 2-7, you see Adam receiving breath through his nostrils from the living God, and it said he became a living soul, which is a whole different dimension of life. It's not like an animal just breathing. It's a human being breathing with consciousness of something much higher than himself. And that's what God puts in the human life. Job 32.8 says this, it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, El Shaddai, that makes him to understand. The reason you have cogency, the reason you have faculty of mind is because God put that within the brain work of your life. Who do you think the smartest man ever lived? You can participate. Was it Solomon? That's what the Bible confirms, right? He was the wisest man ever to walk on the earth. Well, do you know that kings and rulers and everybody just kept coming to just hear him and his wisdom and to see the vastness of his wealth? There was a queen of Sheba that came. It took almost a month to get where, where Solomon's uh, kingdom was and with a caravan. And she was amazed at what she heard and at what she saw. And she brought gold, and then she took some gold back. Nobody knows a whole lot about the Queen of Sheba, but in Second Chronicles 9, verse 22 and 23, do you know the whole secret of that was? The Scriptures say that God put that in the mind of Solomon. I want you to think about that for just a moment. When we encounter a really super intelligent person, we think they're simply a brainiac. That's coming from the supreme knowledge of the entire universe. And God gives us the ability to discern, to formulate things of constructive sentences and so forth as we communicate. This is God's doing, and we have to acknowledge it as such. So he's commanded here to preach and to command air or breath to come. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe on these slain that they may live. Then in verse 10, he goes ahead and does it. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived. They stood on their feet, and it was an exceedingly great army. So that must have been a battlefield at one time, which we often see in the Old Testament and how they met within a valley and they fought, and whoever won took the spoils and they left, and there's all the corpse laying around. But he prophesied, and by God's command, they became alive. Now, to prophesy means this, speaking God's message under the influence of God's Spirit. That's a pretty simple definition, but that's what's happening. 
Do you realize every time our pastor or a, a fellow pastor preaches the gospel, the same authority is happening? That when they're preaching repentance unto God, the forgiveness of sins, they're doing it with the authority of Christ's blood from the pulpit to your heart. And when conviction settles on a soul and you see the evidence of that conviction through repentance and sometimes tears for sin, that's the same authority you're coming alive that Ezekiel was preaching by. And it's no different today. When the pages of Scripture leap from the page to the pulse, that is the Spirit of the living God performing His supernatural work. And so it says in verse 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. He's talking about resurrection power. And we see that now as Christ came on the scene and the soldier's daughter died, and he raises her from the dead. And then he comes to Lazarus' grave in John chapter 11, and he's four days in there. Behold, he stinketh. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. What happens? He's in his grave clothes, and he's walking out of the tomb. What kind of power is that? And then he's on the cross in Matthew 27 and graves open up while he's uttering his last breaths. The rent, the, uh, the temple is, uh, the veil is rent in two. Graves open up. And lo and behold, the Savior takes the sin of the world upon himself and takes it to the grave. But his grave opens up three days later. And where does this new life come from? It's the Spirit of the living God still doing His work of regenerating the evilness of the human heart. It says in the uh, last part of verse 12, I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, you shall live, and I'll place you in your own land, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Watch this word closely. I have spoken, I will do it, declares the Lord. Verse, uh, or Psalm 39, 9 says, he spoke it. It came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. There's no compromise. There's no way to thwart any of what God's sovereign will is. And he does it because he says, I want you to know that I am the Lord. That occurs over 85 times in the book of Ezekiel. He wants to be known. He wants to be known for his goodness. He wants to be known for his power. He wants to be known that he rules over all. And hence, that's why we're humbled before him. We realize his position as almighty God. So let's go back to our previous chapter where we were and we'll finish that, okay? We left off there right at the end of verse uh, 27. I will put my spirit within you. I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes. Be careful to obey my rules. How does this uh, holy phenomena happen? He's the one who gives the new heart. God, the Holy Spirit, performs heart transplants. I'll give you a couple of illustrations. Daniel chapter 4 a very arrogant king, the very one who has these Israelites captive. Nebuchadnezzar is challenged. His whole pride is challenged. The living God says, you didn't do any of what you think you did when he was on his patio saying, look at the kingdom I've done. 
He goes, oh yeah? So he forces Nebuchadnezzar on his hands and knees and he has to eat grass. His fingernails grow and curl up. His hair gets long. Dew starts just uh, accumulating on his back like he's an animal. And then in chapter 4 of Daniel, verse 34, he says, my understanding came back to me. My heart changed. A whole different level of awareness occurred to my mind. And he worshiped God. He repented as a pagan king and said, I'm going to exalt this God of the Israelites. Well, let's fast forward to the New Testament. We had this Saul of Tarsus who just despised the church that the people of the way, that new message other than Judaism. And he's going to persecute some more Christians on the way to Damascus. And you know the story. He's blinded. He's totally uh, helpless. He's got to be led by the hand. And Jesus himself appears. He says, Saul, Saul, why, why are you kicking against me? And you know the rest of the story. The scales fall off of his eyes. He starts to really see. And he's a new man. Did it happen on his own? No. Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching the first sermon at Pentecost. He's talking about the blood of Christ and how it, how it cleanses the sin of our very human nature. And what happens? 3,000 are cut to the heart. What kind of work is that? That's just not saying, yeah, I need to turn over a new leaf. That's a whole new transaction. It's the living God by His Spirit infiltrating your very flesh and changing the whole thing. And figuratively, in Hebrew, when you say heart, it's your whole being. It means the whole person. So that's what regeneration is, and that's what Ezekiel's describing here. This is what he does. This is the miracle of new birth. And so we know from Ephesians 2, we're dead. We're dead in trespasses and sin. We don't have a spiritual pulse. We're unable to dial 911 spiritually. That doesn't even occur to us. And so when Ezekiel proclaims, thus says the Lord, the same is true of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's resurrection power. In Hebrews 1, it says, in times past, he spoke through his prophets in various ways. But in these last days, I have spoken through my son. And that was the message that Jesus proclaimed, new life in him and no other. I am the way, the life no man comes to the Father but by me. And he proclaims that truth. And so we have God the Father electing, God the Son redeeming, God the Holy Spirit regenerating. And he's moving and he infiltrates that sin-darkened heart and he ascends that stubborn staircase of volition, the sinful pride, our self-grasping spirits, the lustfulness, the evil heart of stone. And with surgical precision, he cuts it away and transplant a new heart that's beating and throbbing by efficacious grace. And it's a gift of eternal proportion because new life begins. The evidence of this is revealed by godly sorrow for sin. Repentance unto God. And then joy unspeakable. Paul defines it and says it's a mystery of godliness. Praise God for his love, his mercy, his grace, that they are causal. Salvation is not merely an intellectual assent. Oh yeah, it certainly is rational. But that rational uh, revelation is, the, is not the cause, but it's the revelation of God at work and we simply affirm it. The work is monergistic, and then on into our 
perfection and our sanctification become synergistic because it's by his initial invitation to do the work. And he does it. And it says he will not fail. He will complete it until the very end. Isn't that assuring? Do you want to depend on your own strength? I don't. Especially with COVID around. No way. We won't make it. So thus accomplishing the promise and covenant of God in Christ Jesus, it says in verse 28, you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Context immediate, Israel. Context future, the entire heavenly kingdom which is ours in Christ Jesus. That's our final land. That's our final Zion. John describes it very good in the book of Revelation. No tears, no sorrow, no pain, no nothing. That's the destination for the believer. Now that has hope to leave all of this and to go in the presence of a living God who made us. Isn't that the completion of our faith? Amen? I mean, it, it, it's... It's the whole motivation of why we keep seeking the things of God. We have a destination. This isn't it. It's heavenly. It's otherworldly. Now, when Ezekiel finishes the rest of his book, and it has 48 chapters, he goes on in the next few chapters to describe this restored Jerusalem. And he, he's given dimensions of, of the walls and the gates and the colors and everything that's going to get involved. And it, and it starts to translate more like what John describes heaven's going to be like. But do you know what the last word of the book of Ezekiel is? It's Yehovah Shema. That means God is there. Remember we did the names of God a couple years back? We didn't do that one. We, there's no J sound in Hebrew, but we would probably say Jehovah Shema. And, and it's so assuring. God ends his book with God is there. The Lord is there. And he's still there. As a matter of fact, he never left. And he's always there. And he always will be there because he's the omniscient, omnipresent God of the entire created universe. Now that should be assuring. If you're struggling with how to cope with all of the adversity of today's world, it takes the focus of the gospel of Jesus Christ to just reorient your entire thought pattern and say, hallelujah, I'm not staying here that long. I'm going to be in the presence of the very one who made me. I don't know about you, but that comforts my soul. To not have to fight all of this stuff on the earthly level, including a China virus. I mean, you just get tired of this nonsense. You know, we can't even smile at each other. It's, it, it, really, it's a strain. It's a strain on our fellowship to have to wear these masks. And I'm not going to go off on a, you know, like, like what's his name? That, never mind, no. That's what he said, never mind. Huh? Okay, let's, let's close with a prayer, shall we? Bowing our heads. Holy Father, we thank you that we are your people and you alone are God. And there is no other. So praise be to your name that you perform heart transplants by the word of your power through a risen Christ. Penetrate and possess our entire being, we pray, so utterly that our life is the radiance of your mercy, your love, your grace in this dark world. Empower us 
to walk worthy of our calling unto the glory, honor, and praise of your name. Amen. May God bless his word. Having been given new hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's walk in new life. Happy New Year. Have a good afternoon.